everyone, Jim Branscombe here for the Cinematic Void Vlog. Today I'm going to talk about an aspect of the thing I do that I wasn't really prepared for, not sure I want to ever do, which was doing Q&As with talent, you know, actors, directors, cinematographers, other crew members, writers, that kind of stuff. And when I started Cinematic Void and film programming, all I want to do was just pick movies and, you know, maybe say a couple words beforehand and then sit down and enjoy them. But one of the aspects of doing this is occasionally doing Q&As, and I wasn't always comfortable or didn't think I was very good at it, but, you know, over the years I've now done 100 plus Q&As, I've kind of recently just figured out, it's like, wow, that's a, that's a lot of people to talk to. And yeah, there's been a few repeats, but there's also been plenty of ones that have, you know, been great opportunities. And I figured just to do a little something different on the blog, I'm going to you know, break down and talk about a few of the Q and A's I've done over the years that are my personal favorites. Uh, not going to be doing them in a top 10 type of deal because that's kind of hard to gauge, but basically I'm just going to pull a couple clips out of the archive and, you know, kind of set it up in the context of how this event Q and A all came together. And if you guys enjoy it, Hey, I'll keep doing it. But for now, this is just part one. Maybe there's a part two. Who knows? But to kick things off, I decided to kind of focus on Q and A's I've done since the world reopened post like lockdown. And the reason being is that I think all the things in Q and A's I did pre COVID-19 lockdown pandemic, whatever you want to call it at this point, I, I don't think they were bad, but I wasn't as confident as I am now. So I'm going to just kind of start with some that happened, you know, pretty soon after movie theaters reopened and I could go back and host screens there. The first one I'm gonna talk about is a film that I was trying my damnedest to screen for a very, very long time and then just kind of the opportunity landed. And that film is Get Crazy, directed by Alan Arkish, who also directed Rock and Roll High School and you know was a Corman disciple. And this is one of my favorite kind of New Year's Eve movies. It's just a fun kind of party. It stars, you know, Malcolm McDowell, Daniel Stern, uh, Lou Reed's in it. It's, you know, it's a really, really great movie. And the opportunity to screen it had, you know, kind of just never landed for me. But like, hey, we're at this new venue, Lost Fields 3. At the time, I was doing monthly screenings. So when I sent in my pitch for December 2021, I just was like, I want to do Get Crazy. And I kind of knew it wouldn't be actually on New Year's Eve, but, you know, it was close enough. And it kind of tied into the Blu-ray release that Keanu Lorber was doing for Get Crazy. So I reached out to director Alan Arkish, who was really excited to be able to do this. He actually told me a few people he would like to invite, so I sent him those invites, and it ended up being Lori Eastside, who played Nada in the movie, and Lee Ving, who played Piggy. And for those you don't know, Lee Ving is also the singer of one of the you know, biggest, greatest punk bands that ever existed, Fear, plus he's been in other stuff like Clue. So here's a couple clips from that Q&A. This is post-screening. It was a sold-out crowd at the Lost Fields 3. Energy was high. People were having a really good time, and it was a blast of a Q&A. What are they going to do? Hey, Jimmy, what's up, man? We had no fun making this, none. <laughs> so, Alan, why don't you tell us about how this came to be, Get Crazy? Okay, so um, Daniel Patashu and I were working at the Fillmore East on the stage crew, along with a bunch of other people, and this, in our minds, is kind of what it was like, <laughs> okay? Um, it was very intense, and the experience, if you notice that Danny Stern never sits down in the course of the movie. That is pretty much the way it was. And uh, it was that kind of atmosphere. We were living it. We were working on the Fillmore, or at the Fillmore maybe Fridays till Sunday morning, going to NYU. And we decided that we wanted to make a movie about it, uh, like about 1970. And then all during the 70s, I worked for Roger Corman. And that's when I did Rock and Roll High School. And, uh, and, and Danny went off and became a roadie for Bob Dylan, among other people. And we got together, we decided I had a terrible flop of a movie, and I decided I wanted to get back to doing a rock and roll movie. So Danny and I worked out the outline for this movie, and that was called Hell's a Rockin'. 
which is based on an Olson and Johnson movie called Hell's a Poppin', but any case, it was very much like this. But it was set in the late 60s, and it was more of a memoir, and a different feel. It was not as frantic or crazy, and the storyline was different. We could not sell it. We sold it finally to a company who said, we will buy this and make this if you bring it up to date, 1983 which is when we made it. So we did that, and Danny did a bunch of drafts, and then they decided, told me that, well, we will now put this into production, but it needs more nudity, it needs to be more like Porky's, which was a big hit, and it needs to be more like Airplane, a joke a minute. And at that point, in all fairness, I, my career was nowhere, and I really was into this movie, and I loved the music and so forth, so Danny wished me well, and he left, and we had two more writers, and we started going to make the movie. Now, the entire movie is made at the Wiltern Theater. Ah, yeah. I never Woo! did anything in New York. <laughs> and I never left California to make this movie. That's right, we were right there on the Wiltern. With the movie shot, because again, this movie just looks like you guys had a fucking blast the whole entire time. I thought all movies were like this. <laughs> and then I went out to work in the film business, and I was like, ugh. Now, what was the editing process like? Because you had to keep the energy up for this yeah. movie at all times. So, uh, it was shot on 35 millimeter film. Uh, mostly two cameras and some of the numbers three. And it was edited on a steam back. Uh, a three-headed steam back for we could run three picture heads at once. I think we actually lashed together two of them. And I think we could run a bunch of soundtracks. And there was three editors working at once. And we overlapped all our actions and everything. And we did it away from all the executives. And we hired, we didn't hire, I was in love with this book on editing called When the Shooting Stops by a guy by the name of Ralph Rosenblum. And Ralph Rosenblum was an editor out of New York who embraced the new style of editing uh, with movies like The Pawn Broker and um, A Thousand Clowns. And uh, he saw a terrible, terrible rough cut of a movie that he thought was really funny, but no one knew what they wanted to do with it. And he took the job, and that was Woody Allen's first movie. <laughs> so he cut Take the Money and Run, and he cut everything up through uh, the last one he did was Manhattan, he cut the producers, and so we brought Ralph out twice, and he watched our cuts, and because of the intensity of the movie, and we thought we could get really lost in telling the story, Ralph was like our, our anchor, and he really guided us through it. I have to say, of all the things I've done, I think this is one of the best cut, and that the editors did an amazing job. This is like pure propulsion, you know, the way it builds. And um, your number, Lee, I mean, I just love that, you know. I never get tired of watching that and the song, you know, so. Bless you, man, thank you. The editing was great, and then we tested it, and the audience, not so much. Let's hear it from Alan Arkish, come on. So we tested it, and the audience was confused. And our executives, um, well, let me just say this. One of them committed suicide and the other ended up in jail. All right, so. <laughs> this next Q&A took place in May 2022. It was actually part of a bigger series that the American Cinematheque was doing, celebrating the films of 1982. 1982 is considered a big landmark year of films like the Thing came out, and I'm now blanking on, you know, E.T. and things like that. It was one of the biggest genre, you know, film years ever. And the Cinematech had said, hey, would you want to do Last American Version? Because it came out in 1982, and I said, absolutely. The Last American Version is one of my favorite 80s sex comedies. It also has one of the darkest, most brutal gut punch endings to any film ever. If you haven't seen it, I'm not going to spoil it, but Jesus Christ, it is bleak as anything. And... You know, they're just, this was another film that just, I talked about screening, tried to plan a screen, just never really landed, but you know, it worked out now. And I reached out to two of the stars of the movie, Lawrence Monison and Diane Franklin, and they both came out. They did a little bit of an autograph signing beforehand. The screening went really, really well. It was a sellout. 
half the crowd was people that were, you know, big Last American Virgin fans. The other half the crowd had never seen it. And, you know, when that gut punch ending hit, you know, you could feel the air get sucked out of the room. And there was a big round of applause then. And then I think 10 couples went out because it's, you know, probably ruined their date night or whatever. But after the film brought out Lawrence and Diane Franklin. So here's a couple clips from that conversation, which was a real blast. As you can tell from watching these clips that both Diane and Lawrence have a real love and respect for the film, as well as the film's director, Boaz Davison, who I reached out to, couldn't get a hold of to show up, but you know, incidentally enough, his daughter actually showed up, which was really cool and, you know, could pass along that, like, you know, the appreciation, just how much of a fan I am of Last American Version, as well as one of my favorite underrated slasher movies that Boaz also directed, which is X-Ray, AKA Hospital Massacre. So, but the cast actually is a really unique type chemistry altogether. So how did you guys work together? Like, even though you didn't have a rehearsal, was it just interacting, just getting to know each other between shots or yeah, off time? I don't, I, I'm trying to remember. I'm amazed uh, watching it at, at the relationships of, of the friends. And I mean, really, I've done uh, this many years and, it is fresh, it's like seeing it new. I, I, I mean, I remember the time, I remember Steve was already like such a groovy cat in Hollywood. I mean, he knew everybody, he went everywhere, and I was like, oh my God, he's so cool. And I like, live in the north of Ventura Boulevard in Encino. It wasn't even Tarzana, which is worse. <laughs> and so that was Steve, and I mean, and then there's this beautiful, beautiful young, I don't know. I don't know how that happened. I mean, a lot of it, I think, was Boaz. I mean, Boaz, I mean, this film is so masterfully, like, edited. And, I mean, and that it was, that's all Boaz. I was going to ask you both, what was it like working with Boaz as a director? I fucking loved Boaz. I, he, for me, was everything on this movie. I mean, I was a young, young, inexperienced actor and I think again because it was autobiographical Boaz was just just lasered on me all the time and I, I, I just love him. I mean he just walked with me from the beginning until the end. It was really special for me. Um, I have to agree. I mean um, so here I am. Uh, I have all this experience with like obviously this is like the first movie I've done in a film, the first uh, I mean, lead, and um, this was kind of, I mean, there's many things about this. I remember that the one thing that when I got this part, the one thing I was nervous about, aside obviously from doing nudity for the first time, um, was that I couldn't ride a bike. <laughs> and in the, in the script it says, and Karen rides her moped into the scene, and she rides it out of the scene, and I cannot ride a bike. I have uh, like hearing problems, like I'm deaf on my right ear, so I have balancing problems. And people through my whole entire life have tried to teach me how to ride a bike, not happening. So I, that was so nervous that I remember going up to Bo and going, I can't ride the bike. And he's like, what? What are you saying? And I'm like, I, I, sorry, I can't, I can't do it. I, I thought I was gonna get fired. I literally thought that's what it would take. And he's like, oh no, we'll just fix that. And I was like, oh. You know, like that he just was such a good, heart, like good sport to do that. And that's when I think I started to trust him more because we really didn't know each other that much. And then when we did our intimate, more intimate scenes, oh, he was such a gentleman and so professional. Like I wish all directors had his, um, his heart, you know? Because he just comes, he, he wasn't pushing or rushing and he was, uh, he really just knew how to work with actors. And I think because maybe the film came from his heart, um, you know, it just, it, it just came, it resonated to the cast. What, what do you guys think about the legacy of this movie now that's been 40 years and how it's kind of grown and evolved over that time? Oh, well, I, I have to say, first of all, I always say that um, Let's Learn Conversion is like a, a treasure chest of the 80s, so or it's like a, um, it's like a, microcosm of all 80s experiences is, is the look, the fashion, the music, the issues. You know, it was so funny when, when we started to trick Jack Daniels and I heard the audience go, ooh. And I thought, wow, like that? Was what, what, what about getting into the car drunk? Like, yeah, well, yeah well, that's what I was going to get into the car drunk, right? That was the thing, like, wow, that's a whole kid. I don't know that place anymore. 
Um, and the, I'm sure the cocaine and all of the drugs stuff, but that, I mean, and it's so funny, and it's so awesome, but it's just so interesting. I'm like, okay, well, like abortion, you know, like, getting pregnant. And, I, and like, when I got pregnant, like, I was pregnant, I'm thinking, people are laughing. And I'm thinking, is it, so, is it funny today? I don't know. Like, it just has a different thing, maybe just because it's more campy. Maybe it's because of the music and playing over and over, right? <laughs> right? <laughs> and I went, oh my gosh, we're playing it again. It's the music. It's like, the music, right? It is. Um, but the subject matter, like, you know, um, I know like that abortion scene is, it just grounds everybody. Like everyone goes, oh, you know, and brilliant with this, uh, was this a wife that editing when he, I'm going and then the pizza cutting, you know, that was brilliant. You know, the very, that's like to me like a nonverbal, you know, that's filmmaking. I cannot believe it's, it's far here. That's just so intense and weird. <laughs> but I believe it's still here because of the ending. I mean, there's, you know, that first love and that innocence that is something that so many of us, it's a moment in time, right? For every, every boy and every girl, and I mean, I've heard for 40 years from young men and then older men is like, dude, that was me, you have no idea, like, pain. <laughs> but there is something about that first, that first love, and that, it, there's just something very beautiful that's captured. And that, for I mean, you know that this experience with this girl will affect this this boy for, for many many years to come. And to see that happen is it's a powerful thing, and I think it's something that we can all relate to the scars of the heart, you know. Now, for the last Q and A, I want to talk a little bit about on this vlog is. You know, for a movie I've loved for many, many years, and again, you know, it was something that I always kind of wanted to screen, and it just kind of came together. It is Over the Edge. This was actually part of a bigger tribute to director Jonathan Kaplan. If you don't know who Jonathan Kaplan is, he directed Over the Edge. He also directed Truck Turner, and he worked on ER for many, many years as a director and producer, and like, you should look him up. He had a great career starting with Roger Corman going through basically the late 90s and, you know, television stuff in between. And I had done previous screenings with Jonathan in person. I did um, Truck Turner and I had done The Student Teachers along with um, Dan Apashaw, who was the screenwriter of that movie. But this one's a little bit special. And I'm gonna admit that I was not really in a good place mentally at the time when I was going through the series. And honestly, being able to do these Q and A's with Jonathan Kaplan and everyone involved, really, really was just something that I could hold on to and look forward to and just, you know, gave me something to throw myself into when I was dealing with some really difficult stuff. And for this Over the Edge Q&A, it was Jonathan Kaplan, it was co-writer Tim Hunter, who went on to direct another Edge movie, River's Edge, and one of the actors from the movie, Pamela Ludwig, who showed up unexpectedly. Well, maybe not for Jonathan, he invited her and then he forgot to tell me she was coming, but it, it's all good, this was, you know, a really, really fun, great Q&A. Now, when you got attached as a director, how was it working with Tim and Charles, like, we're kind of like working on the script and like getting ready to, you know? Right, it was great. I mean, for Tim and I have known each other since we were 14. So. 14, 14, I think. 10? 10, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, no, it was, it was great collaboration. So, I just want to ask you about the casting of this film, because there's a lot of like, first time actors, novice actors, and we have one over here, Pamela. Pamela. How did you become involved with this film? Uh, so I auditioned like everybody else. Yeah, just uh, I was uh, I was eighteen. The rest of the cast was like, fourteen, 15, fourteen or fifteen. Yeah. So I was really you know adult, and I didn't have to have an escort on the set or whatever they were called, tutors or whatever. Um, but yeah, I was in New York, and in fact, I guess all the cast was cast out of New York, except for all the the, um, the extras and smaller parts. They were all Colorado kids. But um, so I was already acting in New York, and I you know got called back and called back, and then finally um, screen tested and got the part. Was it kind of the process of getting everyone involved? Because were you just looking for? Not, not necessarily like established actors, but people that fit the mold. Yeah, well, Vic, Vic Brown was just a casting director, and the first two weeks, and t Tim and Charlie were, were in Colorado casting the, the you know, yeah, the kids, most of the kids, but the leads were casting in New York, and the first two weeks we saw professional kids, 
and they were all like cute commercial kids. You know, they were just like completely wrong. Now, with the script, Tim, that you Charles wrote with, as you know, the, the head cast was, and this will this provoke you, John, Tim, is like how much leeway did the actors get with the text or the words and the dialogue? Were they given freedom to kind of adjust things as they, you know, were more comfortable with, or was it like set in stone kind of thing? It wasn't. It wasn't set in stone, and, and you wrote a, a bunch of stuff on it. Mostly, I said, "How would you guys?" Say it? That's what. That was great. You know, like the two girls. I forgot their names. The two. The two Marcy girls. And the, yeah. The, the, yeah. 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 I don't know. Was that dialogue? I, I don't know. No, like practice your piano. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> right. You just left it. You just said, "Go for it," and then. Right. It, yeah. So there was a certain amount of freedom. And, and like yeah, Matt, 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 Tom Fergus Clark, he says, yeah, my mom's got a group tonight. So that was him. That was him. <laughs> 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 well, Charlie and I were pretty good at stutter speaking those days. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. They did. Uh, they wrote a lot of stuff. And you, uh, the, 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 you wrote the, the, the tips of death, death dealer in my yeah, life. Yeah, right. <laughs> here, here, Jonathan. Yeah. You know, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't make the group. Uh, yeah, I'm out here on the street like yeah. everyone else. <laughs> <laughs> and I was getting to memorize that. Because like, there wasn't a lot of memorization going on. But I said, look, you got it. Eric, you have it. Right. It is amazing seeing that kid be the fucking drug kingpin. <laughs> <laughs> Now, the, one of the most memorable lines in the film, which Matt Bill says twice, is kid that tells one another kid has a dead hand. Where did that come from? We wrote it. <laughs> um, I remember we were, uh, Jonathan, was, we were, Jonathan was shooting the big finale in the Greeley at the, at the school, you know, for about a week. Yeah, but we started, I started to, and we wanted to shoot that first so the kids would have all had, have experienced it, which was, it, it worked, it definitely worked, but it was, it was ultimately like, because it was nights, it was like seven nights or five nights. Everyone was just from then on just trash. <laughs> <laughs> and, and Charlie and I were there, and you know, as you directed it, you needed stuff to fill the space. And he was constantly saying, "Write more dialogue. I need lines here. I need some stuff for them here." So there's a lot of voiceover dialogue that we wrote right there on the on the spot. Right. And those teachers and stuff. Those kids were so stoned. <laughs> <laughs> and Charlie and I would chaperone them up to Greeley on the bus and the bonds came out literally. <laughs> <laughs> we wouldn't want to be a chaperone on this bus. <laughs> so I want to ask you about next was this movie basically finding its audience a few years later because obviously you had the dawn of the um, video store because it was a big video store hit as well as HBO. When did you guys notice that this movie was starting to gain real traction and like a real kind of cult to a bigger audience? I think more than more, more so with early cable. That was I mean, HBO, wasn't it? Yeah, HBO? It, it, yeah. it was just showing on HBO and, and it, you know, kids were seeing it. Yeah. <laughs> Those kids. Yeah, no, and, and it was uh, when Kurt Cobain discovered the movie <laughs> and led, I didn't know, you know, I, I remember getting this call about that something, something Nirvana wants to get a print of the movie. And I thought, Nirvana, is that like, you know, it's just like some sort of, like, you know, cult. So, but I couldn't imagine a print of the movie. Then once, once people found out that this was Kurt Cobain's favorite movie, then it really took off. Well, I mean, they've, the Smoke Like Heat Spirit music would use pretty much based on this. Yeah, yeah. And that's kind of my next question, which is the cultural impact, because obviously Kirk Cobain was a big fan. There's a band at DC called Nation of Ulysses that did a song called Kid that Tells on Another Kid as a Dead Kid. There, I've heard, yeah, old DC kind of like hardcore band. But then there's countless bands I've heard, like, I think before I saw Over the Edge, I heard sound clips from Over the Edge and millions and millions of punk records. Cool. So, there's a band called Lou Melba. Right. Yeah. <laughs> 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 we should get some of these. 
<laughs> like I said, you guys are a lot of oil. But what are your thoughts on like how it's kind of got taken into culturally and ended up in you know music and other movies like Rich Linklater said it was one of his inspirations for Dazed and Confused. What are your thoughts on that? It's great. I mean, you know, it's it's just you just you know look before there was cable, before there was uh, you know VHSs and DVDs, and you know that you make you could make a movie, and I have. And it's, you know, and then it, it comes out, it doesn't do very well, and then it's never seen again. And so, but now, you know, everything had, there's some place that, that people can discover. So it was, you know, over the years, it was, it was heartbreaking when it looked like it was going to be the Children of the Dam campaign and, and done. You know, that was really heartbreaking. Even though I told everybody, I kept saying that, you know, I think Jonathan shame. was more upset for us. Than he was for himself. And so, well, yeah. it's, you know, so, so it was, so it's, it's incredibly rewarding to have to get discovered. So that's a few of my favorite Q&As that I've done over the eight plus years of Cinematic Void's existence. Tell me what you think of this episode. If you want to see more of this kind of stuff and, you know, I got a whole archive of Q&As I've done. I wish I had everything I've done. Some of them were just never videotaped, but like, you know, it still might be fun to talk about those even though I don't have any audiovisual records, but it might have some photos. So if you're digging this, give it a thumbs up, like, subscribe, all that stuff you're supposed to do on YouTube. and. Yeah, let me know in the comments and if there's been a void screening that you've been to and a Q&A you've been to that was like, hey, that was really great that you would like to see me talk a little bit more about, hey, shout it out in the comments. But until next time, see you in the void.